last week uh, coming and speaking. He told me what he spoke about, a great message about the church and uh, being involved in the the work of the ministry here, and I appreciate him doing that. Uh, We took a little break, obviously, and went out of town, 40th wedding anniversary. We're back, and uh, glad to be able to come this morning. And I want to speak and continue on our series with one another, and I want to talk about a one another concept that's been lost, a one another concept that we really don't pay attention to today, a one another concept that we have to go back to, and that is being kind, being kind. I was asked you this morning, how many of you uh, know folks that aren't kind? Uh, we all would raise our hands. Uh, how many can name uh, people on, the, on one hand that are kind? Uh, we might be able to get one hand. I'm not talking about when we go to the grocery store or the bank or places, but just people in general uh, that are kind. Uh, we could probably raise up on one hand people that are truly that we would consider kind, uh, kind in attitude and character and uh, all the rest of those things, kind in action. Once you found Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, would you stand with me for the reading of the Word of God? Then, of course, remain standing for a word of prayer as well. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, the Apostle Paul wrote the church at Ephesus, And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Father, we're, we're excited of what you're going to do amongst us today. We thank you, Father, for your spirit that reigns, your spirit that speaks, your spirit that guides. I thank you for each one that's here. I thank you, Father, you brought folks back that have been vacationing and uh, been gone. You brought them back safely. And you protected them and, Lord, supplied and take, uh, just do all that needed to be done uh, to bring them back safely to this place. I thank you, Father, also for those folks that filled in uh, during this past couple of weeks and took care of things and some stretched beyond uh, with their, nor- their normalcy, if you would. And even this morning, I thank you for that. We ask you, Father, continue to work in our lives, in our church. And Lord, continue to, to do a work in us and through us as the Spirit of God uh, makes us into your workmanship. We ask you this morning, Father, to continually uh, be with us this morning. I ask you, as always, forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Father, fill me with your spirit this morning. As we look at your word, uh, Father, may there be times that we'll stop and evaluate ourselves to make sure that we're doing exactly what we've been challenged to do in this one another statement this morning, to be kind. Thank you, Father, for your grace, your mercy to us. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be said, may be seated. It's interesting to me that about in the last 10 years or so, uh, we have heard these statements. In fact, there was even a movie a while back, and we've heard these statements, and we've been challenged to do this, to perform random acts of kindness. How many have heard that before? Uh, we've heard people say, do random acts of kindness. Uh, we know that uh, there's other things that go on. In fact, we uh, hear about people doing passing it forward and Someone does something nice to us, and so we in turn do something nice to someone in front of us or be kind to someone uh, that's coming down in front of us or behind us or whatever else. And so we're passing it forward. We're doing random acts of kindness. But notice something important. The Bible predates both of those concepts that we've tried to uh, push this morning or progress up this morning. And we notice the Apostle Paul challenged to be ye kind one to another. Here's something interesting. If the people at the church of Ephesus was being kind one to another, the apostle Paul would not have had to write and challenge them to do so in a letter. Amen? How many would agree with that? If they were already doing it, they're already participating in it, there would be no need for them to tell them. When I was a kid, my grandmother, uh, she pretty much, I hung out at her house quite often. And, and my grandmother, even when I got up in the military, out of the military, I was 21 when I came back home, went in when I was 17. And even previous to 17 back and 21 up until my grandmother passed away, she would tell me this, now, Ronnie, don't forget when you cross the street to look both ways. 
Now, why would my grandmother tell me that? Because obviously, sometimes she observed me doing what? Not looking both ways before I crossed the street. And so notice, she would tell me those things. She would remind me, this is important for you to do so. And she wouldn't add this, but I added this to our kids because you don't want to end up being a hood ornament someplace, amen? Uh, we want to make sure you're safe and protected and watched over. And, but notice, the Apostle Paul challenged the church at Ephesus that they were to be kind to one another because obviously there was issues in them that was not producing this. Now, I'm not saying today, uh, eeny, meeny, miny, mo, you be kind, you be kind, you don't have to. Uh, you be, uh, and I don't, because I don't know. Well, if you're kind, praise the Lord if you are. But this is a one another uh, series that we're doing. This is the next one on the list. And so I want to challenge you this morning to be kind, to be kind. It's easy for us not to be kind. You notice that? It's easy for us not to be kind. And so it's going to take work, and we'll look this morning at three things I'll share with you here in a few minutes. And so it's easy for us not to be kind. And sometimes we're not kind because we disagree with someone, and rather to disagree agreeably, we want to disagree disagreeably and aggressively. That's not being kind. Uh, it's not being kind by cutting people off just because we don't like them or don't care about them. That's not being kind. Uh, we don't like our neighbor because they don't take care of the weeds in their yard or they don't pull their trash cans in. And so we don't speak to them when they speak to us. That's not being kind. Get the idea? And so it's difficult sometimes for us to be kind. And so we have to be challenged to do exactly that. And so the Apostle Paul wrote, that we are to be kind one to another. You say, wait a minute, it's only for the church at Ephesus. They're the only ones that needed to be kind. Can I tell you something? It's for all Christians all the time. And we're all to be kind as believers. Remember, we, there's our indications and characteristics that I believe that the world looks for in believers, and unfortunately, sometimes they don't see them. And this is one of them. This is one of them. How many times has an has a unbeliever told a Christian or heard them tell a Christian, I thought a Christian ought to act like this? Amen? Because they know how a Christian ought to act. And so we, in turn, ought to do what? We ought to be kind one to another. The word be, by the way, because he says be kind, be ye kind one to another. The verb be is a present tense. And it means continuous action. And so it ought to be something that flows through us naturally, a continuous action. You know, it's almost like this. If we have a tendency not to do something, we have to stop ourselves to make us do it. Amen? It's like, for instance, if we do not ask God for a blessing over the food or thank you for the food that we're about to eat, we have to stop and do so. Until when? Until it becomes a natural action. When we were younger, and uh, I first uh, met Vicky, and uh, we'd sit down to eat. Man, it'd be like, you know, we're waiting, uh, like one hog waits for another hog. Man, it's like grabbing the grub and start shoving it in. And, but then after we started going to church and we knew that we ought to thank God for what he did, it had to become an action that we had to change. And so it was something that we had to stop and think about stop and begin to be involved in, stop and give thanks to God, then eventually, guess what happened? It becomes a natural action because it's something that becomes part of us, something that we know that we need to do, but it becomes a natural thing that we do. Get the idea? It's like when we don't do it, then we think, what did I miss? Did I miss my vitamins? Did I miss my vegetables, my salad, my meat? What did, did I miss dessert? Well, what did I miss is I... Because what we missed was not giving God thanks for how he's provided for us. So it's a continuous action. It's something that begins to be so continuous within us that it becomes natural. That's what the concept of be means. But he also uses an adjective. The adjective is kind. In the Greek, uh, it's a kertos. And it means to be mild, pleasant, easy, gracious. It refers to being useful or fit for use. I kind of like word studies and this idea of being kind, fit for use, or being useful. 
something that's kind, mild, pleasant, easy, gracious. And I begin to think some examples of it. Could you imagine going in for surgery and you're laying there and how many times, you know, they put you under twilight so you're still kind of aware of what's going on. And could you imagine you're laying there in a twilight and the surgeon says, we need to remove some organ from your body. And he says to the attending nurse there, hey, can you hand me the butter knife? How many would say, whoa, time out here. I don't want a butter Did you understand a butter knife is not fit for use to open up a body or to be used for surgery? We say, hey, stop. We don't want you to do that. You know why? Because that's not going to be kind, going to be kind. I know that if you're a man, this might be the first uh, tool that you reach for uh, out of your toolbox. But in reality, it's really not a tool we ought to use all the time. We ought not to use a vice grip, amen, for everything. Why? Because a vice grip is not being kind. It will strip the bolt or strip the screw or strip something. We know we use it when something's stripped, but it ought not to be something we always use. And yet, if I was to ask you this morning, what's the first tool that most of us grab? Will be what? A, a vice grip and then a hammer and then maybe duct tape because we have to repair the things that we beat to death. Amen? And so notice we, we might grab those type of things. But notice in reality, though, a vice grip, is not being, it's not really not fit for use for many uses that we think it's fit for. And so notice the concept, the adjective is kind. It means mel, uh, mild and pleasant and easy and gracious. And so Paul stressed that we are to be kind to one another every day in every situation. You know what this is? It's being kind is love in action. That's all it is, love in action. Being forgiving, love in action. Uh, being exhorting, love in action. Edification, love in action. It's being kind, it's being love in action. It's using the love that we have out of us and oozing out so that we'll be kind to someone else. Can I tell you what it is? It's a heart thing. It's a heart thing. We'll find out in a few minutes it will be a mind thing that will naturally become a heart thing. Get the idea? We have to be determined to be kind, and eventually it becomes a heart thing. First, it's a mind thing. Be kind one to another. Thinking about it, making a continuous action so it will be a natural flow from our heart. Let me give you three things this morning real quickly. Pretty, they're pretty practical, pretty easy. There's more than we could use, but I just want to give you three things. Number one, we ought to be concerned. If we're going to be kind one to another, we need to be concerned. Proverbs 20, verse 5 says, Counsel in the heart of man is like deep water, but a man of understanding will draw it out. You say concern. We, we ought to be concerned to show kindness one to another. What exactly are we talking about? Man, we show concern by asking questions. By asking questions. Oh, it's not giving information. It's asking questions. Can I tell you something important? I know about everyone in this auditorium something because I've asked questions. I've asked questions. Oh, you say, well, preacher, don't you not know there's a fine line between uh, prying or nosiness and asking? Yeah, there is. I agree with that. There is. Uh, sometimes, you, uh, sometimes you can ask more questions than what people want to reveal. And, but understand that how do we find out about people? We ask questions. And we ask questions so we know how to pray for them or to show that we're concerned about them or that we want to know them. And so literally, if we're going to be kind, then we need to be concerned. And if we're going to be concerned, then we need to ask questions. So it's not, for instance, it's not us uh, asking a question, hoping someone will ask me a question so I could really tell them what I get the idea. It's not that. It's asking a question. And it's asking a question whether someone asks us a question back or not. What do you mean? Well, aren't you asking a question? So I'll ask you a question so you can sit there and talk and give us all. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about asking a question. Why? Because Proverbs chapter 20, verse number 5 says this. It tells us that counsel in the heart of man is like deep water. But a man of understanding will draw it out. Draw it out. You ever been around somebody and you can look on their face like they're carrying a burden and you ask them what's wrong and they say nothing? 
if you're married, some of you understand that more than others, amen? And so when you ask them, there's nothing. You think there's something wrong. I can tell there's something wrong. I can tell by the countenance upon your face. I can see how your shoulders are rolled over. I can see how you're walking, how you're sitting, how you're standing. I can see that you're carrying a burden. The furrow in your head, all of those, on your face, all of those things are indicating that. And notice what the scripture says. It's by asking questions we can draw it out. Why? Because it's deep within there. And sometimes people want to be relieved of their burden, but they don't want to have their burden relieved just to anyone, and they don't want to tell just anyone what their issue is. They want to tell someone who truly is concerned, concerned, concerned. I hate to tell you, but every time if I tell someone I'm a pastor, within some time, whether they're somebody don't even attend this church or someone that's not even with Christ, Man, eventually it will come around, whether that day, the next day, or some other time when they see me, they begin to tell me their burdens, their issues, their problems. And guess what I could do? One of two things. I could tell them, I don't have time, or I can stop and listen. I can show concern. I can show concern. And we as Christians ought to show concern. We ought to be kind one to another. Do you realize that if we as believers, especially during this time in which we're living, the time in which we're facing, if we have burdens that we're carrying, do you not think there's others that are carrying burdens as well? Then I look around the world today and people are absolutely hurting. And they're hurting because there's the unknown. I listened to something the other day and they're talking about this election, and they've even now come up with a study, of course, and I'm no doubt they've poured billions of dollars into a study, and they're saying this, why are people so discouraged, and why are people so angry, and why are people so insecure during this time? <laughs> Common sense tells me it's the unknown has caused them insecurity. Why don't they just give me the money, amen? Uh, but they, they don't, they're, they're trying to figure out why. And if so if we as believers are feeling those, those insecurities, those issues, those problems, are there not others that feel it exactly the same? And we see people that are like that. When we go to the grocery store, we go to get gas, we go to work, we're involved in our community. And so we see people exactly the same way. And if, if we're concerned, guess what? They are concerned as well. But the thing that we can do to help them along is to be kind one to another. We notice the more questions we ask about someone, uh, the more we'll learn about them. A person's problems, their fears, their hurts are like deep waters, but a concerned person can draw them out. We can draw out what is bothering someone by asking questions that will bring the issue to the surface. And because people that they do not want to be a burden to others, they'll not generally tell people their problems, their issues, their concerns. But we can look at people's faces and we can see uh, how they walk and see the burden in which they're carrying so that we can show kindness and concern by just being friendly to those individuals. But I can tell you this, there's no better words that we can speak than words of concern. So what should we do then to be kind and show concern? We need to look for opportunities to show concern. I remember when this, this stuff just first started back in March. We were going to the grocery store, and I went up to Fry's up here on Tangerine and, and Thornydale. And, of course, by the time that everything was gone, no uh, beans and rice was gone, of course, toilet paper was gone, and all those kind of things, cleaning supplies was gone, and, Vicky had given me a list of stuff to go to the grocery store with. And so I'm going to the grocery store. Of course, I'm going up and down the, the aisles and nothing's there. And if there was things there, that little sign, only take one of this and take one of that and, you know, and, you know all that kind of stuff. And so we get up to the cash register. And uh, this poor woman that's there as a cashier, I mean, she looked like she had been through a battle already. It was like about 8 o'clock in the morning. Store had been open a couple of hours or Hair is all just kind of wild looking, and uh, her makeup is running and around her face, and I think a poor girl needs to look in a mirror because she looks like she's been beat up. Somebody ought to help her, give her a break or something, and 
She just looked tired. And, and so I said, have you been here long? <laughs> she goes, no, just a couple hours. I thought, oh, my word. Imagine it will be like eight hours from now or six hours from now, the poor thing. And, and it was interesting because the guy in front of me, uh, he began to rant and rave because he bought two of something. And she said, I'm sorry, sir, you can only have one of this. And the guy began to yell at her things like, what are you doing? You're hoarding our food. You're going to take this home for yourself. And um, just begin to go off on that poor girl. And by me coming back behind and just talking to her and said, hey, I know it's been a hard day today and praying for you. And, and you know, I, I just hope that everything goes by quickly for you this morning and blah, blah, blah. Then you could see her count. And now, of course, her makeup didn't change and her, her hair didn't get straightened up. And, you know, it'd be like a wilted flower. And all of a sudden she's like, ah. It didn't happen like all of that, but you get the idea. Man, you could see a change in her countenance. It was like a, a relief, and all I did was say a couple of words. I didn't give her any extra money. Uh, I didn't try to bribe her. Didn't do any of those things like that. Didn't buy her gift cards or candy or, or anything. Just said a few kind words. And how important it is that we, if we truly uh, want to be kind one to another, show concern. And, man, it's written on people's face sometimes. And so we as believers, we need to look for opportunities so that we can be kind one to another. Number two, we ought to be nice. Well, that's, that's something we miss out a lot. Just be nice. Be nice. Listen to Proverbs eleven seventeen. The merciful man doeth good to his own soul, but he that is cruel troubleth his own flesh. Here's something interesting. When we're not nice, guess who is the one that ends up suffering? Not the individual that we've not been nice to, but the scripture, the Proverbs says to, it's us that ends up suffering. It's us that ends up feeling the repercussions. It's us. And so notice, just be nice. You say, what do you mean be nice? And then your parents ever tell you to be nice? You're doing something and you're griping, complaining, you're fighting with your brother and your mom and dad comes and say, hey, be nice. Be nice. I had someone tell me, Vicki and I, we've married 40 years, and uh, our relationship works for us, and, and we argue, and uh, we bicker about silly stuff sometimes. We both are strong-headed. Uh, we both have strong opinions about things. And I had someone tell me before, they, when they first met us, they said, man, you guys need to be nice. I think we are being nice. This works for us. We, we get along. We're not arguing. We're not fighting. We're not divorcing. We're not running off to a lawyer somewhere. This is what we do. It works for us. We're opinionated, and we're strong opinionated people, and, and we're expressing our attitude. But notice how important it is that even when we express negativity, even when we express a different attitude, guess what we should do? We should still be nice. Because notice it does not necessarily affect the individual that we're not being nice to, but it affects us, the Proverbs says. Listen again, Proverbs eleven seventeen: The merciful man doeth good to his own soul, but he that is cruel troubleth who? His own flesh. His own flesh. See, we're living in a world where being nice and well-mannered are becoming more and more rare. Amen? And we think that when we go to a store or we go to a restaurant or we go to someone they serve us, that we don't have to say thank you or smile to them. Well, I'm giving them my money. Isn't that good enough? No, it's not necessarily good enough. It's being kind and well-mannered. It's telling folks, thank you, please. Man, many times we see people open the door and we just kind of blaze right through. They're like, nobody's business. There's nothing wrong for us to say, thank you for doing this. Hey, thanks for your kindness, your niceness. And notice that we're living in a world where being nice and well-mannered, it's out the door. I'm not sure if, if parents aren't teaching their kids to say thank you or you're welcome or anything else like that. But notice how important it is that we are to be the example, especially as believers, to be nice and well-mannered. In this crude and world, weird, rude world, Christians are to shine as lights as they exhibit kindness by being nice to others. Notice two ways that we as believers can be kind. Number one is this. It's by not kicking a fellow believer when they're down. Catch that? It's not kicking a fellow believer when they're down. I've heard this saying years ago, and it's still at Tripoli, even today, that the Christian church are the only ones that kills its allies and exalts their enemies. You know what that means? That when someone is down, that we are also ganging up on them, also trying to destroy them, 
also trying to hurt them. And notice as Christians, for us to be kind one to another, man, that we're not to kick a fellow believer when they're down. Our responsibility is to edify them, to build them up, to exhort them, to pick them up and get them back on track again. But how easy is it for us to rejoice when another Christian falls into sin, when another pastor goes down the pike into sin, and then we rejoice about that, or they get what they deserve, or we say this, or we say that. Our responsibility, if we're going to be kind one to another, is that we don't kick a fellow believer when we're down. We lift them up. The second thing how to show kindness is this, is by lifting up others when they have stumbled and when they have fallen. And sometimes we can see folks begin to stumble and begin to fall. And guess our responsibility is to make sure we pick them up. This last week on, I believe it was Wednesday, uh, Vicki and I were leaving Utah. We were driving down to Arizona. We're on 89A. Beautiful drive. Man, the trees are changing and all kinds of other good stuff. And We're driving down through there, and we stopped, and uh, we used to do this when we were dating, and so we were talking about doing it and again, and so I went and got some French bread and got some salami and cheese, a couple apples and different stuff, and so we'd picnicked once before, and we were coming back down and heading off to Flagstaff, and so we stopped someplace. We found a park bench, so we stopped to get ready to have lunch again, some sandwiches and whatever, and so we're getting out to go do this, and uh, Vicky's going to the table, and I'm carrying the stuff behind her getting there, and and then all of a sudden, she uh, hit some uneven ground, and she began to stumble forward. And when she did, uh, she hit this four-by-four four post that's holding up a, an overhang with her shoulder, and man, just bopped it pretty good. And, and the only reason why I know that she hit it is because I'm trying to, I've got the stuff, and I'm walking over there. Uh, two things. One, I saw her bounce off of it. And then somebody that was also pulling up their truck, this guy jumped down, an older guy, uh, he jumped out of the truck and he asked, are you okay, are you okay, and was going to try to help her. And I thought, man, what a great, and I told the guy, I said, hey, man, I really appreciate you being concerned about my wife. Because, you know what, because people aren't concerned about who? Their own selves. And in reality, the guy got there way before I got there, and he could have kept her from falling on her face. Because it looked like that's the way, when I saw it, it looked like that was the way that she was going, but she was able to upright herself. And would have fallen. You know what happens when you get a little bit aged? Uh, your body no longer, anyway, you get the idea. You're not going to just fall down and bounce back up. You're going to be laying there for a good while. And so I was concerned about what's going on. He was concerned about what's going on. Notice how important it is that we grab someone, uh, that we're concerned about somebody, that we're being nice to someone, and we lift them up before they stumble, before they fall. See, being kind to those struggling in their Christian walk goes a long way. And the benefit of being kind, it benefits our own soul. Well, we can be nice to others by never raising our voice in anger or frustration. And the first sign that we're losing control is when we begin to yell at somebody else. Amen? When no one can sit there and begin to talk, and pretty soon they're screaming above each other because they're upset and they're frustrated, they're angry. But you know what? There are two types of yelling. You say, well, preacher, is all yelling bad? No, not all yelling's bad. There is two types. There's yelling for a warning, telling folks, watch out because danger is coming. And the second one is yelling because they didn't pay attention to the danger. Amen? And notice the important one. We are to yell a warning, but never we're not to yell because someone has, did not heed our warning. Man, there was many times I'd tell our kids, watch out for this. And then when they would not do it, I yelled at them because they didn't pay attention to what I said. That's not the kind of yelling that we ought to have. That's frustration. And sometimes we do that out of anger. But there ought to be yelling for a warning. And so I mean, when we say we should never raise our voice, no, there's times we ought to raise our voice. And we ought to do it for a warning. And I think when we do it for a warning, it's being nice to folks. It's telling them, watch out. But understand this. If we yell at them because they did not heed our warning, then we're doing it out of our own frustration because they didn't pay attention to us or they didn't do what we want. Can I tell you something to be honest with you? That's not being nice. That's not being nice. That's just us being upset and letting folks know how we feel. 
about what took place or what we were going through. Notice also, when we lose control of the volume of our voice, we lose control of the words that we speak, which can result in saying hurtful things. There's five things, I think, that we need to remember when it comes to speaking. Number one, spoken words said without thought can cut deeply and hurt worse than any physical blow. And how often do we say things without stopping and thinking of what we're saying? Now, I'm not big on, well, let's stop and think how someone would respond to how you said that. We're not talking about that. We're talking about speaking to someone and stop and thinking about what we say so that we can take the edge off. So it's not begin to go in there and, and just knock them around or, or if you would drive a stake through their heart, but it's speaking to them. Number two, hurtful words can ruin a relationship. Hurtful words can re ruin a relationship. And I hate to say this, but I know that it's true that normally the ones in a relationship that say the hateful words is the husband. And the one that remembers those things is the wife. Amen? Come on, let's be honest. Amen? We say things that we regret later. And I can tell you this, those things that we say that we regret later, our wives do not forget them. They remember those things. How do we know that? Because they bring them up to us. And they bring them up to us in the most uh, weird places like in another argument about something else or another disagreement about something else. And all of a sudden, those things come out. Why? Because they built in bitterness and resentfulness. But if we would just would have stopped and thought about what we were going to say and stopped and thought about how we were going to say it, we could have avoided a lot of trouble in our relationship. Number three. We're to speak the truth, and that's important. But we're not just to speak the truth, because speaking the truth without love is brutality, and speaking just love without truth is hypocrisy, but we are to speak the truth in love, in love. And it's to be in love when we speak the truth and think about how we talk to make sure that it's not destroying someone. And notice, it's speaking the truth and make sure it's always the truth. But there's a way to do so, and, he, and Paul says, and he challenges us that we're to speak it in truth. Number four, once words are spoken, here's the bad part, they can never be taken back. Never be taken back. If I was to ask you this morning, how many of you wish you had an ironclad net to catch words that you've said? Let me buy an ironclad net, because they can't go out. They can be kept in that. But understand, our words are like a net that's full of holes that the moment that we speak, they're out there and they cannot be taken back. Cannot be taken back. It's too late. That's why we have to be nice. That's why we have to be kind one to another. And lastly, sometimes no word is better than any word. Sometimes no word is better than any word word. Sometimes it's better to be thought a fool than open our mouth and remove all doubt. Sometimes no word is better. Notice lastly, we can be kind and we can be concerned and we can be nice, but I want you to notice something important. When we talk about being kind, it's a verb. It's a continuous action. It's something that continuously needs to be part of our lives. It's an action. And so how are we going to put this into action? How is it going to be something that we begin to use in our life? And it's by doing this. It's by being determined. And we have to make a determination that we're going to be kind. Notice, put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. Put on, therefore... And so if we're truly going to be kind to people, be concerned about them, be nice to them, we must be determined to do it. Why? Because it's not a continuous action in our life. We are not born in kindness. And we're not born to be nice. And we're not born to be concerned. Why? Because we're born self-centered and prideful and sinful. And we want what's ours. And we want it how? We want it now. 
And so we desire that, and we desire it and desire it. If you don't believe that's true, you listen to the TV and listen to the new announcements coming out about election. Then there's one on there, woman talking about Medicare. I want what's mine. Really? People today, vote for this person or vote for that person. Why? Because you'll get what you want. They'll give you what you want to receive. But notice we're self-centered, and so what do we do? We buy into that because we want those things. And so niceties, if you would, it is not just something that naturally flows out of us. You don't think that's true? Look back when your kids were growing up and there was toys in a room, and they had all of their toys laying around them, and they're playing with their favorite toy, and some other kid walks in and reaches down and grabs a toy they're, even, they're not even paying attention to. Might be one they've discarded and threw away, could care less about it, and the moment that another kid touches it, what do they say? That's mine. <laughs> That's selfishness. That's pride. That's sin. And it's sin that's within them automatically. The same as the sin that was with us. So we've got to be determined then to be kind. See, being kind doesn't come naturally. Because we are flawed. We are selfish. We are sinful. So we must be determined to be kind. And notice two reasons why we ought to be kind. The first one is because the Bible commands it. And we ought to be obedient to the word of God. The second reason is because being kind one to another requires us to focus on the results. The result of kindness. The result of kindness. It's interesting to me that some folks will complain about somebody not being kind to them. And they in turn have not been kind to that individual. Amen. You ever notice that? That's the worst service we ever received in a restaurant before. Well, maybe if you're kind to them and thanked them and, and treated them with respect, they might have given you what? Better service. But we complain about that because we've not shown kindness. We weren't determined to go out of our way, determined to do anything. So what happens? We don't receive what the kindness that we wanted. It's determination, and we've got to be determined to do so. See, God's kindness, by the way, leads us to repentance. And God knows the way to change us is through kindness. And it's amazing how little kindness can change people. If there's a difficult person in our life, just try being kind. It'll be amazing the difference we'll see. Kindness is something that we need to determine to have in our lives. Well, notice two things, and I'm done. To be kind one to another, we must, determine to be, we must be determined to be kind, number one, in public. In public. We've got to be determined to be kind in public. When we're around other people. Man, you know what? I learned a long time ago, these are not the words to use to my wife when she comes out and asks me, how do I look in this? Well, that's got to be the ugliest outfit I've ever seen. Man, I can tell you what, it turns off like that. And sometimes you'll know people that are like that. Man, they're not kind in public. They'll say things that are inappropriate. They'll, re they'll, re they'll treat people that's inappropriate. And notice, it's being kind in public. We must be determined to generously sow seeds of kindness. I remember one time I'm standing or, or driving in down when Marana had their food uh, farmer's market thing. They give away, I think, 60 pounds of food, and uh, they're loading up with people with food and things. And uh, the worker came to me. I'm next in line. The worker said this, uh, we're going to charge you 12 bucks for this food, uh, but I want you to understand we're not charging you for your food. Uh, the person in front of you has paid for your food, and you're going to pay for the person behind you. I said, okay. And then he began to tell me this. What happened, the very first person in line that morning paid for two people's food. So what they did is that they paid for themselves, and they paid for the car in back. And the person, the very first person said this, you're to tell everybody along the line that they're to pass this on and continue this thing going. So the next person paid for the person to get the idea. But notice something interesting. The blessing was the one that received, obviously. I praise God we received it, but I also got an opportunity to give as well. But you know there was one person in that line that did not receive the blessing of giving? You know who that was? The last person in line. 
They only received the blessing of receiving, and they didn't receive the blessing of giving. Now, I don't know what they did at the line. I didn't wait, wait for them to see. Uh, I took my stuff and went home. But you get the idea? See, it's just being the kind in public. Do they have to do that? No. How often do we see someone and we purchase their meal, we try to assist them, we try to help them? A couple months ago, we were standing in line, we we're uh, driving through Taco Bell after church, and we we're in there, and I looked up, and there was a Marana police uh, uh, a guy behind us in his car, and I told Vicky, I said, let's buy him, uh, buy him uh, go ahead and buy his meal. And so we bought his meal, and next thing I know, the guy comes flying behind me, I'm thinking, oh, I mean, am I speeding too much when I got my lights on and look all around? He just pulls up beside and says, hey, I want to I tell you how much I appreciate you doing that. And he had a big grin on his face, and I thought, this was during the whole time when, you know, kill the cops, defund the cops, get rid of cops. And, and you know what? It didn't cost us not even $10 to be kind in public, to be kind in public. And notice how important it is that we see that, and, and we notice that to be kind in public. In reality, we're to speak and act kind one to another, even when others do not exhibit kindness to us, or they even return the kindness in which we give. But the second place we ought to be kind is private, in private. Because I believe that this kindness in public, man, it's a great thing to do, and we can put on the airs of kindness by just trying to be kind to people and say kind things to them. But in reality, where this really matters, and the important thing is, is to be kind in private. When no one else knows except the one you're being kind to. The one that you're reaching out to. And I'm not a very kind person in reality. Um, I don't look for things, and, and I just tell you, I'm just a normal kind of guy like everybody else is. But there's two things that we started doing at our home a long time ago that's went a long way. One is Vicki only cooks for me and her now, and I always try to make it a point to thank her for what she's cooked. And it's amazing to me that she never complains about having to get up and cook. Now, I'm not a cook. I'm not one to be involved in the kitchen at all when it comes to preparing food. I have to call her when she's gone and ask her, hey, what button do I push to cook a burrito or whatever else, because I have no clue. I don't cook. I could care less about cooking. But man, but thanking her to do so, I know it's work. And I know it's work because there's pots and pans and there's stuff scattered and there's stuff over here that's just to put together. And I just, so I know that it's work. The second thing I found out is that when I'm done is to get up and take care of my own stuff, my own dishes, my own different things like that. You say, do you do that and do you tell us to do that or whatever? Yeah, I'm telling you, it goes a long way to be kind in private. And how easy is it for us to forget to be kind in private because we start taking people for advantage and we begin to take people that are closest to us to advantage. How do we do that? By being rude to them, by not thanking them, by not taking the time to do so. You ever know that in the church that we become so familiar with one another that we forget to thank people for things they do? You ever notice that? Because we're around them. And we understand that we're brothers and sisters in Christ. We read scripture where Paul writes and others write, beloved and brethren and all the rest. And we know that we're brothers and sisters in Christ. But we still need to be kind one to another. And stop and think about the things we say and how that others might react to those things. Be nice. Be determined to be kind. Be concerned one to another. It goes a long way. You know, there's one thing I found out when we first got here to Desert Springs that people said about this church, it's a friendly church. And I started thinking, what does it mean to be friendly? It's mean to be kind one to another, be loving, be concerned, being nice one to another. What a great reputation that Desert Springs has. But I'd like to challenge you this morning. Don't get rid of that reputation because it needs still to be part of the character, the attributes of Desert Springs Baptist Church. Father, this morning, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the challenge that's given to us. Lord, if any time in our lives 
that we need to be kind, it's now. We see a world of chaos, a world of unkindness, a world of selfishness, of pride, a world that's consumed with themselves. And Lord, it's so easy for us to be caught up into that because we see it. It's around us. We become ones that are unfortunately are victims of it as well. So Lord, help us to be kind, to exhibit kindness. May it be a continuous action that flows out of us. May it be something that we've taken in our minds of a determination that's become a heart thing to us, that we've naturally be kind to one another. With every head bowed and every eye closed, let me ask you some things. Where is your concern? Is it just for yourself or is it for others? Have you become consumed with your own self, that that's the focus, or is the concern been for others as well? Do you need prayer to control your speech? Say, preacher, would you pray for me? Man, it's so easy for me to to become angry and upset about situations, upset about circumstances. Would you pray for me this morning? Is there anyone like that? Pray for me. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. All over, amen. Thank you. Anyone else this morning? Thank you. Anyone else this morning? Pray for me. Are you determined to be?